cautious of basically our perception as well of the test. Because this last part is interesting. The public perceive that significant consequences accompany test results. So one of the things this reminds me of is in the U.S. we had this No Child Left Behind Act that was created. And one of the consequences of students not doing well on these high stakes exam, exams, so these were basically every student had to take these exams, is that teachers would lose their jobs or be demoted if they didn't do well. And so this is something that you know, society has to have a discourse about. Is that an appropriate way of utilizing high stakes exams? Or is that something that should not be under educational policy because it's not helpful? Um, sorry, that was a judgment. <laughs> but I really think um, there's, a, there's a lot more that goes into high sta stakes exams. Um, and there's a lot more that goes into classroom work and they're not necessarily <coughs> compatible or comparable. So these, that's another example of perceptions of the impact that high stakes exams will have. Also, I know when I was a student, I was tested, and they're still tested, I know it was many, many years ago, but they're still tested um, on reading skills, for example. And in the States, we test at the end of every grade level. And they'll say, well, your reading skills are very good. You're in second grade, but you're reading at fourth grade level, or high school level, or this level, or that level. So in that context, um, the consequences or the perceptions that accompany the tests are OK. You know, because it, it works as a motivating factor. Because if you get a decent grade level, you're going to be like, yay, I'm only a second grader, but I'm reading like X, Y, and Z type of person. Um, so that's in one case that these sort of, sort of high stakes tests can be positive. Um, the next one, I'd like us just to maybe take a few minutes, if you wouldn't mind working in small groups, and we'll discuss these questions and then let's get back together as a whole group to share. So bullet point number one is what critical perspectives do teachers and students have about the effects of high stakes testing? So what are their, what are their ideas about high stakes testing? The next one, how do intended and unintended consequences of high stakes testing affect students? So in this case, we discussed it previously a little bit, but try to go maybe a little more into depth about the intended and unintended, um, unintended consequences. Number three, how do intended and unintended consequences um, of high stakes testing affect, affect in, instruction and classroom practices? So. If we have high stakes testing, how does it affect how you teach, right? Or how does it affect how students study or behave in the classroom? And if you were thinking about maybe implementing high stakes testing at a middle school level, because you said you don't have it, right? Mm -hmm. try, to, try to kind of brainstorm what might happen in the classroom as a result of implementing something like that. Um, the next one here, what strategies can we incorporate to eliminate or reduce the unintended consequences of high stakes assessment? So there may be a problem, what's the solution? So we're looking for solutions in this question. And the last one, are there arguments to support high stakes assessment? And what are they? So why is it positive? Why should we continue to have high stakes assessment? Because there is definitely a place for it in the classroom. Okay. Questions about the questions? You ready to discuss? You didn't think you had to do work, did you? <laughs> you just thought you'd come here, sit down, and listen. Mm -hmm. Ha ha, I will do. <laughs> OK, so how many minutes would you like to discuss these? Uh, should we discuss all the questions, or yes, we choose you one? Yes, <laughs> <laughs> Nice bargaining, nice bargaining, and I like it. But no, <laughs> discuss them all. <laughs> um, OK, how many minutes? What would you say? Would you like 10 minutes? Okay. 10 minutes? Okay. An X amount of students, and that was really motivating. And so then you went 
you developed your own knowledge. It encouraged you to keep going further and to learn more mm -hmm. because of the test. Because it, well, because of the results of the test, not because of the test. So it's like a double-edged sword, right? Sometimes, well, I, I know some stories that, that that's how it actually sometimes happens when you study only for the test because you just need a mark and you, uh -huh. and you think, oh, after the test I'll just forget it and never recall it again. And then when you get a very good mark, you, you start thinking, well, I can be good at it. And you start actually learning. Then. Yeah, yeah. That's a really interesting point. And it's one of those where it's like, mm -hmm. there's no right or wrong answer. It just de I, I think it's a lot like what you all were saying where it, it kind of depends on how you're taught to interpret the test scores as both a teacher and as a student. Mm -hmm. Excellent. I'd this like to say that sky is, sky is the limit. Mm -hmm. There is some kind of competition in the group. Mm -hmm. okay. And more advanced students, if they really understand that well, really, sky is the limit, I try my best. Okay. So this may encourage them to just do as good as they can. Yeah, sure, why not? So that would be the motivational aspect. <laughs> um, this group, what does necessarily mean you can also produce it? So I would encourage your group of teachers to consider how that, I mean, it'll be harder for you to assess because you're going to have to look at the writing, but it is important that there is production other than choosing A, B, C, D, or 1, 2, 3, 4. It's, it is... It's like, it's like a TOEFL exam. <laughs> Sorry? It's like a TOEFL exam. Yeah. They, uh, they test this, uh, they ask you to, uh, to type, yeah? And to, to write down. Right. They yeah. have an essay portion of the TOEFL. That's yeah. right. But in our, in the Ukraine, in, in this, in, 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 in the Yes, they are not testing. Yes, but the, they don't have this. They just have multiple choice. They will develop, I have faith. Yeah. Yeah, no, I really, I have a lot of faith, especially, I know you guys are all like, oh, I, but um, I, I worked on the next, well, I didn't work on it, but I helped to edit and give feedback on the next national exam that will be coming out this year for mm -hmm. your students in secondary school, and I know that um, we've encouraged or we're having some experts come, some assessment experts come and just basically uh, work on the test for the next year even. So I think that you'll see over the next few years a lot of changes in the national exa um, examination and stuff. You have to start from somewhere, you know? It's like, it's like three teachers writing all of these in addition to everything else they have to do. So um, it, it takes a while, but they do work hard. Um, back to what you were saying though, one of the ways that I used to get my students after they've taken an exam to actually do the corrections or think about the corrections, instead of correcting it myself, again I would put my little symbols so that they could find what they needed to find in the textbook, and then I would say if you correct it, you'll get X points added to your final mark. And so that would motivate them. It normally motivates them. I mean, for those students who got good marks, they're probably not going to be motivated. They're like, yeah, whatever, I'm not going to bother. But for the students who did not do so well, that might be the difference between them passing and failing. And it might also be the difference between them actually looking at um, the test and using it as a tool as it's intended to be. Yeah. Can, can we touch here a problem of objectiveness and subjectiveness? Sure. I mean, I hate checking compositions. Because when I check, mm. I have my feelings, I give it to my partner, and another teacher evaluates differently. Mm -hmm. mm. It's more like uh, subjectiveness. Yeah, um, I use rubrics a lot. Because I had the, you know, that's just, that's human nature. We're going to either like what they have to say or we're not. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things is I don't necessarily test their opinion itself on something. I test how they support their opinion, how their opinion is developed, and the structure in which they express themselves. Because then you can be subjective. You know, you're not like going, ooh, I hate what they just said, 
S. <laughs> you know, you're like, okay, uh, I need to just take a moment. I really don't like what this paper is saying, but do they have good arguments? Yes. Do they have this? Yes. Do they have topic sentences? and the paragraphs are according to the topic sentences, yes. Do they have transition sentences at the bottom of the paragraph? Yes. Do they have a thesis statement? Do they have a conclusion? Yes. Okay. <laughs> and so that, yeah, it's really um, like, like a method, you know, it's, I forgot how to say that word. Method, how do you say it, Jeff? Method, method. No, methodological. Methodological, yeah. <laughs> so you're just kind of going do, 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 do. Step by step. Yeah. And that way there's, it's more object. There's always going to be some subjection to it. Because what if their topic sentence for you is not the same as a topic sentence for someone else? Like they, the other person sees the connection more than you did. Um, that's also possible, but I think um, that's where it's really, really important to have a very clear criteria and a rubric that says, you know, a, an A paper is this, 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 and this, and then give them samples, and then that way you're, you're doing everything that you can to take away the um, subjectivity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a problem in the Ukrainian uh, schools and uh, in general in, uh, in the universities too. They do not give the students the uh, disability to, uh, to write uh, the, like a set. Mm -hmm. so they do not have this tradition. Right, say. And we don't have this uh, points with the effort. Like topic sentence, like uh, beginning. Mm -hmm. Because it's like, yeah, we, have, we can we do this in school, but we have only like. Um, the beginning, the uh, the main part, and the end, mm -hmm. and that's all. Three paragraph essay, yeah. yeah. Paragraph. But in the essay, we have more. Mm -hmm. But topic sentence, uh, uh, do you know what is the topic sentence? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, because we are teachers, <laughs> you know what does it mean. But uh, in general, people do not know what does it mean. Yeah. That's and, why we are here to <laughs> this exam. And I would also make sure I was very well informed about who created the exam and what they wanted to take from the exam. Because I don't ever want to buy it. I don't ever want to put my students in a situation where okay, where they they're taking an exam that I'm like, yes, this will be a great exam, it will test this, this, and this, but then for whatever reason, the exam, the people who created the exam are actually testing something else. Yeah. yeah, because even when you read about the test, you know, unless you yourself have a practice test that you can look at so that you know exactly what's on the test, it's really hard to, to, mm -hmm. to tell. Even if, as I used to do with the other teachers when, um, at the place I used to work, we would all be teaching the same level and two people would create each test and so while that's great because we split up the work you know so mm -hmm. the first test the second test and the third test were done by different people you never really knew what was on the tests and some of the unintended <laughs> consequences are that teachers would teach things that they weren't it's not that they weren't supposed to teach them, but not everybody was teaching the same thing and it appeared on the test and then that's not fair to the students, right? Um, so, those are thoughts. Um, and then, are there arguments to support high stakes assessment and what are they? Like the obvious uh, argument is I'm high stake assessment sorts of tests are used to do this, but as a diagnostic test at the beginning of the school year and then again at the end of the school year, mm -hmm. a similar test, just so that you gauge how much learning actually took place for the individual learners. Mm -hmm. So that's one area where I think that um, they are very beneficial and also as we talked about previously motivation mm -hmm. uh, sometimes they can be motivating 
asking, but can I ask you a question? Yeah. Sometimes I work as a tutor. I mean, I get all the private students. Mm -hmm. And there are no tests at all. I only teach, 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 give the material, and that's it. Well, one thing, so... Yeah, I, I'm thinking that... And the promise is very high. I know that my student really knows a right. lot. And I never, I never waste time on testing. So I would... Time. Oh, I agree and disagree. So I agree that you don't want to take too much time for tests, but I think one nice thing about tests is it gives the student a chance to feel a sense of accomplishment. For example, one of the things that I noticed um, when I travel, sometimes I go and I talk to groups of learners. And some of what occurs during those conversations is they get so excited they can understand me. Because, you know, for them, previously it's just been the teacher and tape recordings and blah, 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 blah. They didn't realize that they could actually understand and follow a native speaker. And so I think that there is a way to use testing and assessment so that we can motivate them. Um, you know, it, maybe if some of them could come to an ETRC activity one day, and then that could be, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be a formal assessment, it could be an informal assessment. You know, if they came and watched a movie, and then you said, all right, so I just want you to write your thoughts about the movie, write the main idea, write this, write that. Uh, and then that would give you an idea of how much they actually understood. And so you're still testing them, but it's informally done. Does that make sense? Yeah. The DVD here. This is for anyone, actually. Um, for students as well as for... Uh, if you just have private tutorials. But the nice thing about the game is that they actually get scored based on appropriateness of their choice of dialogue and uh, with different characters that they interact with. And she might find level one really easy, but level two or level three might be more difficult. And again, it's another way to assess her. Um, and it might be something that she could do on her own as well. And then you, you gather her scores every week. So that way she's still going through a process of assessment. Maybe it's just better to, to give some uh, similar... Uh... So number one, assessments must be fair, reliable, and aligned with the curriculum. So I think most of us would agree with that. How would you, if you were to restate this in your own words, what would you say? For example, what do, what do you think fair means? So all the students should be assessed to, like, based on the same principles. Okay. Mm -hmm. And what else would you add? Uh, no? <laughs> and the one answer must be right. <laughs> yeah, that's yes, true. That's true. That's true. <laughs> Very often. Unless you allow for two answers. Yes. It's like either one or right. But yeah. <laughs> okay, that's true. That would be... <laughs> all right. Um, absolutely. What about reliable? Reliable. So reliable basically means that quality. Quality. Uh, quality. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Reliable. I think oftentimes in testing terms would mean that no matter where you give the test, it will have the same results. Mm -hmm. So it it accomplishes the same thing every time you give it. So if we gave it today here and then gave it next week somewhere else, the same results, more or less, would be <coughs> um, by the students. So that's a reliable mm -hmm. test. Mm -hmm. I think a fair test, we also have to consider how it's structured. It's like what we were saying when you gave the great example of, um, what was it? The listening assessment, right? Mm -hmm. Where it was the, so you, were the you, you gave the listening assessment one, right? Or did you? I forgot who described it, sorry. Um, but it was the one where it was just like there was a dictation, you listen, and then after a pause, you write it down, and then maybe you say it back at some point. Um, so that would only be fair if you had done an activity like that already in class so that students <coughs> knew what to expect from that activity. It would not be fair if that was the first time they had ever been exposed to that activity. 
right? So we want to make sure that we're doing similar activities to what we always do. Um, aligned with the curriculum, what does that part mean to you? Test what you actually teach. Exactly, test what you actually teach. And honestly, you know, I think it's really important that on your curriculum, pretend this is your syllabus that you give to your students, there are the objectives. Mm -hmm. And that the mm -hmm. test is matching and measuring whether or not those objectives were achieved, right? That's basically, because obviously the objectives would be based on the curriculum. But does the term exist in placement test? Yeah, but it depends on how you're using it. <laughs> what do you mean by replacement test? Uh, I'm not sure whether to take this book or uh, another book and I give a test without any preparation just to evaluate the level. Oh, that's interesting because, you know, there are different styles of teaching. There's one called TTT and it's test, teach, test. And basically what you do is you test and then based on where, I mean, but the test is not like sit down and write this. You know, it's, it could be a series of activities and while they're doing the activities, you're assessing at the same time. Or it could be a sit down and write this test. But um, based on the feedback that you get from that, you then teach where there are gaps in the knowledge. Mm -hmm. yes. So you're not reteaching what they've already done and then you test again and then you teach based on the assessment um, did they understand where you tried to fill in the gaps in the knowledge? Do they need more practice? You know, so there's a follow-up. So uh, that might be one way that I would think about that question of um, retesting. I know how my first understanding when you said that word was basically retesting to me means that maybe the test did not go well, everybody failed, and so we have a retest. Because <laughs> maybe it was poorly written, or everybody couldn't concentrate on that day, or the, I don't know, the alarm bell sounded, or whatever happened, and the test failed miserably. <laughs> That's what retesting means to me. We understood it was too deep, and we are writing another test. Yeah. <laughs> But I think that there's a space for all of um, the above. <laughs> so I, I think, I do like TTT, that style. Um, I do kind of a mix match of that style as well as other styles of lesson planning, basically. Um, okay, the next one. Testing should include a variety of items, formats, and, that measure both basic and more advanced knowledge skills. And so, um, this is where I go back to multiple choice only. <laughs> but that was a great example because you really do, you want to have a variety of different things because we have to also remember, students aren't good at every one activity, right? Because we all have different skills and we all have different intelligences and um, we're just not the same learner. And so by giving a wide variety of different activities that you can use to assess them, they're more likely to be more successful at the test than by just giving them one form. Mm -hmm. uh, what well, else? I have yeah. a question. So, uh, more advanced knowledge skills. Mm -hmm. So um, I can read the lady that we should uh, assess what we teach. Mm -hmm. and, and so. And as far as I understand, advanced knowledge skills mean something they do not know, but should this be present in the test? I don't necessarily agree. Um, because, I mean, I agree with what you say, but I think when we're teaching, most of the time, uh, what a lot of the research tells us is that we're not just teaching at a very basic level, we're also adding advanced knowledge skills. It's that I plus one idea that Stephen Krashen came up with in 19 something or other, 63, 83, 82, maybe 82. <laughs> it's like a 20 year difference, but anyway. Um, and so basically what it's saying in order to keep students stimulated and involved in the knowledge and gathering and learning is you, know, you not only give them the basic or the easiest level, but you give them some challenging things as well that they answer throughout class. So these would 
these advanced knowledge skills would not necessarily be completely new to them. I agree, that's totally unfair. But they would be slightly more challenging so that you can get a good assessment of where they are. Um, and I think that that would be fair because that would be something that you would be doing with them, or maybe you can't say should, but that could be something that you were doing with them anyway as a part of your regular teaching. But it's good that you pointed that out because maybe this is not so clearly written if it can be interpreted as like something different. It is clear because they have their home tasks and they can find something else which we did not uh, teach them. That's true, that's true. But I think even in that case, um, we can't, we have to be careful about assessing what they might or might not have done in so home tasks. Up to a point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, up to a point. Mm -hmm. yep. Especially if you've gone over the home tasks as a group and talked about what went well and what didn't go well, then um, that would be fair because you've had a discussion and you've continued the dialogue about what was new. Um, any other questions, comments, or concerns about this item? Yes, I'd like to add that testing uh, should have more advanced knowledge skills. If there are no of them, uh, the test will be boring and not interesting for okay. some kind of students. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah uh, that's very true. The test should be challenging. Yes. Yeah, mm. and they must have a chance to yes. show themselves. And right. they like right. the process of competition with each other. Or with themselves. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I always teach them, or I try to teach them, even though they love competing with each other, to compete against themselves. Mm -hmm. But yeah, if that yes. stimulates or motivates yes. them, then that's okay. Mm -hmm. uh, all right, uh, the next one. Good addition, by the way. Test items should reward good teaching. What do you think that one means? Mm -hmm. Also meaning that um, the, S the test items themselves should be based off of what you've taught. And so if you have good teaching practices, oftentimes you're going to have good testing practices as well because you are catering to multiple intelligences. You're including many different types of strategies in not only the language itself, you know, and so those would be good teaching, um, good teaching practices, and so the test items would be able to showcase that. Does that make sense? May I ask a question? Yeah. What to who? The teacher or the student? Hmm? I think in this context we want to look at the word reward, um, maybe not necessarily as to whom. Yeah, that one's one. ours, right? But as... Um, Maybe to both. <laughs> Why not? No comments. Okay. <laughs> um, we say teaching. A teaching, it's like derivative of teachers as mm -hmm. well as students. Mm -hmm. Not learning, but teaching. So it's for teachers. Mm -hmm. It's for, I, I think, like, yes, it should reward good teaching in that it is for teachers, but it's also, I mean, it's, that would be the direct understanding, but I think indirectly, good teaching also is for the students. And so the students are impacted by the good teaching practice. Do you see what I mean? So they're indirectly rewarded as well. Good knowledge of the student is the result of good teaching. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's why. Exactly. Okay, next one. Consideration should be given to the elimination of exams as sole assessment to determine an outcome. Yeah. Yeah? So what are other what are other forms of assessment we can use? Every day of work. Yeah, everyday work. Do they do their homework? How do they do on their homework? What else? Communication. Mm -hmm. Project. Can I say for example? Uh, Einstein, who, he did not show very high results of exams, yeah. comparatively with his wife. His wife was smart according to grades, uh -huh. but Einstein published uh, some scientific papers one after another, and even many scholars and scientists 
couldn't understand that. And his wife, nevertheless, she was an A student, couldn't publish a simple paper or a sheet of you know. Yeah, I think so that's I a great mean, example. It's all like uh, testing your right. out, uh, outcome. Yeah. Well, and I think that's why we have to look for, um, like you said, other forms of assessment. If he was being assessed via those papers, he probably would have been the A student, <laughs> right? Because the professor had been like, this looks great, A plus, I have no idea what it says, <laughs> but it seems to be very important. <laughs> Let me send it to someone at Cambridge or Oxford or Harvard and see if they can figure it out. <laughs> Um, yeah, that's a good that's a good example. Do you sh do you share that with your students? <laughs> After the test. After the test, yeah. But I think it's something to um, think about as teachers as well because I had a friend, and I've told this story before. Um, I am for some standardized testing, but I'm also against some standardized testing because I had a friend who took the equivalent of like the SAT or the, the TOEFL or something like that in like Finnish. He doesn't speak Finnish. He has no idea anything in Finnish. But he was still able to get a good enough grade that shows that he could get a job in Finnish. <laughs> and it was like he only learned strategies for test taking. He didn't actually have to learn the language in order to pass the test. So I think that's why this particular point is on here because test taking itself is a skill that students can develop but it's not the only skill when they're out on the street they're not taking a test they're not having an assessment so what are the other ways we can assess them that encourages them to be out on the street and to try to take risks and talk to people in the other language and maybe even fail occasionally <laughs> in the interaction but not taking it personally, right? Mm -hmm. just didn't work out. <laughs> but if, if we're given a certificate, and sometimes it is written that student attended that course, mm -hmm. and sometimes you write like performed or but not attended, it's mm -hmm. also kind of assessment what your role was in that course, you were only a listener or you did something with excellent results. Yeah, um, I mean that would be a sort of assessment, but I think what this is talking, I, what this I think is really, really getting to is this next line, which, did that do it? It's here, the focus on assessment, not tests. And so even a certificate itself is in some way, um, it's still defining them in a role sort of position. But what we are looking for is what language do they actually know, not what role they had in a workshop, for example. So if you are all coming to this workshop and you're getting your assessment, your assessment, your um, certificate at the end, it doesn't actually assess whether or not you learned anything. It just said you showed up. <laughs> maybe you were awake, maybe you weren't, but you showed up, right? And so I think what, what we're focusing on here is even small things in class, like giving directions, having them do something, and were they able to complete the task? That's assessment. You know, walking around, writing in your notebook as they're going through some of the errors and then teaching based on those errors and then giving them another practice and seeing could they incorporate any of the new knowledge. That's also assessment. <laughs> so I think that's um, the fundamental principle that uh, Jerry wanted to communicate with you all <laughs> in his presentation. <laughs> um, okay, specify intended test use. So I think this is really important, especially to decrease learner anxiety, right? So if this is a diagnostic test, there's no reason for them to be anxious to the point of them not being able to stay still or like having heart palpitations or something, right? Because it's just a diagnostic test. It's like kind of, it's meaningless until the end of the term. <laughs> um, so making sure that they know what's going on, how you're assessing them, why you're assessing them, et cetera, et cetera. 
The next one, um, who are the test users? Or I would say test takers. That would be another way to say user. So um, are they your, your students in grade four? And are they in an advanced level, an intermediate level, a beginner level? Like where, where do they fall? Who are they? As, and what have they studied? Does that make sense? Some people are looking perplexed. Do you about the psychological tests? Okay, tell me more about the transition into psychological testing. We are tested when we are apply for, when we apply for work. Okay. We which, which need some psychological aspects. We are tested by test. Mm -hmm. And they are very critical. And they demand one answer on the right. But usually skills are tested. Not skills, but your... Your ability to cope. Yes. Your communication skills, your <laughs> stress resistance, and so on. Um, they are users. Yes, but generally speaking, they're not necessarily used in the classroom. They're generally used for, like, outside of the classroom. And I think in that context, your <laughs> the people who are employing you are looking for a certain type of person. And so they are, they know who the test users are, right? They're, they're looking for um, future employees. Future employees are going to be, they're the ones taking the test. They're using the test, right? Mm -hmm. And so they have a very, um, they, they know what person or what group of people, specific audience. Yeah, look they have a very specific, specific. yeah. So in the same way that we should also think about our students and their needs and their level and all of the things that we normally, really, normally most of us think about these as teachers, but um, being very aware of the audience. So it wouldn't be appropriate for me, for example, what level are your students? Intermediate. <laughs> and what grade? Like, are they, are they, they're adults, okay, and they're intermediate. It would not be appropriate for me to give her students the GRE, right? Because that is totally <laughs> above their level. <laughs> and why would I do that? You know, that would not be looking at the users, which are pre-intermediate, and taking consideration into um, what their needs are and what I'm trying to do with this test. I think that's the most important thing to think about. What am I trying to accomplish? with this test. Um, also, what is being tested is the next question. So oftentimes a big problem that all of us fall into at some point or another is we say we're going to test grammar and then we end up accidentally testing vocabulary mm. or vice versa. You know, so making sure that whenever we go and create a test we have someone look at it ahead of time to ensure that we're actually testing what we said we were going to test. When, I, when we used to do that committee, like I told you about earlier, where there were um, two of us creating tests every, uh, for the three tests that we had throughout the semester, we always had to give each other the tests just to make sure. And that was consistently the problem that we had in the tests is that there would be, we'd say we were testing one thing, but we ended up testing another thing, and so we'd have to rewrite the test and stuff. Um, it's just something to be aware of. Um, what is the purpose of the test? So why are you doing it? Is it a diagnostic? Is it a midterm? Is it a final? Is it just for fun to see <laughs> where they are? <laughs> so you were bad yesterday, have a test. <laughs> <laughs> to waste time. <laughs> to waste, exactly. Um, what will the impact of the test have on the class? Mm -hmm. So what are your expected, your intended outcomes of the test? Um, and then evaluate the outcomes of the assessment. So making sure that we sit down and we really think about um, this is what the test shows me. This is where the learners are. So how can I incorporate that understanding of where they are and where they need to be 
or where they could be into my teaching and their learning. And incorporate and lobby for multiple forms of assessment. So whenever you're in a situation where there's only one form of assessment being given, trying to change that um, through a long period of time probably. <laughs> uh, at my old school we had I was, luckily I was on the curriculum committee, so we could move the changes along quickly, but they were always giving the same form of test, and it was like, that's not really good enough, because our students had to be at a level where they could learn in English, and so we had a very high level we had to get them through to, at the end of the semester or at the end of the year, and so you have to have different kinds of assessment, not just testing, and so we were able to incorporate that, but thinking about how can I add, um, how can I add, we're talking about paragraph writing. How can I add that as a form of assessment? And I mean, that will help develop so many other skills as well. Grammar, vocabulary, you know, to name two. Just in working on writing. Yes, so, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, so um, I think that's it. Yes, thank you for thank you. and thank participating. You. It was a pleasure to work with you all. Um, I just wanted to remind you before you go, um, make sure you've signed in because I know that you will get a certificate after attending a certain amount of these. Mm -hmm. One um, thing that I would like to just share with you really quickly, on April 2nd, this is not an April Fool's joke, <laughs> this is for real, on April 2nd, I've just learned that National Geographic is going to be coming to Kiev Mohila and we're going to have a little um, meeting in the library. Not this one, but the, 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 the library. library. Mm -hmm. And basically they're going to talk about a new magazine that they're publishing in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. So there's going to be, it'll be interesting. I'm, I'll be there <laughs> and you're all invited. I think you'll probably have to wait for us to send out further information about the time but please stay tuned on our website because that information will be coming soon and it's a limited amount of seating. I think we have about 25 seats. So it's first come, first serve basis. Um, so depending on the time, I hope you can come. Again, it's the second, which is a Tuesday. And what time? Um, we, are, it's, we are working with them right now on the time. That's not certain yet. And there is a movie.